right, good afternoon, ladies. How beautiful is this day? What a beautiful opportunity, right? I love the opportunity to come and for us to just be immersed among women, blessed among women. We can know what a gift that is when we make the time for it. So I hope you're making the most of this day. I hope you had a good lunch. But I just love these opportunities for us to get together and it's like, you're just like steeped in a warm estrogen bath, right? All these women around. This feels comfortable, feels good, right? We need that. I think it's so important. And some of you have been coming up and talking with me. I'm happy to connect with any of you. I'm always just so honored when I get to meet people and they'll share with me a little bit of their story. And they'll share with me something that's going on in their lives or ways that God is working in their lives or ways that they're struggling. It truly is a gift. It's an honor to be a part of that process with you. So thank you. And, and if you haven't come up and said hi yet, I'm going to be around a little bit. Um, my husband Dan is traveling with me, so he'll be here a little bit later as well. So we'd love the opportunity to meet with you. All right, so this, this talk is called Equipped to Shine. And, you know, we talked this morning about blessed and beautiful and how sometimes we don't feel so blessed and beautiful. Also, how sometimes we don't feel quite so shiny, right? So... What is this idea about being equipped to shine? And I think it's important when we're talking about being equipped, you know, there's a, there's a phrase I learned years ago, and it really has stuck with me because it's so 100% true, is that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So you don't have to have your act all together before you say yes to whatever it is that God is calling you to in your life right now. We were talking this morning about this vocation of motherhood, how it looks different for each of us, and even different at different points in our lives. It shifts and it changes, and we're always called to say yes to it, but that doesn't mean you're always going to feel up to the task. And, you know, sometimes it's that disconnect between these beautiful things we know are true, like these beautiful teachings of St. John Paul II about how blessed and beautiful we are, what a gift we're meant to be to the world, and yet... We look around us sometimes and that it's hard to see. And that's really where discouragement lies, in my experience, is when you know these things are good and they are true, and yet in your everyday living out, it doesn't feel present. In fact, sometimes it feels like the opposite is going on. One funny story from my life where I really felt that disconnect between the blessed and the beautiful, which I know to be true about womanhood, and what I was actually living... So let me tell you about the story about the time that I got arrested. Okay, everyone's listening now, okay. Okay, so this was years ago. Uh, I, my husband Dan and I, like I said, had eight children and you know they were probably all about under the age of 16 at the time. I had the giant homeschooler van, right? And there was one Saturday morning where I put a few kids in the van and took the dog. We were going to take the dog over, um, you know, to hit a, a doctor's appointment or whatever. And so we were, like, leaving, and we, we were in our little town. We live in a tiny town in New Hampshire. It has fewer than 2,000 residents. Like, it's a small town. And as I was driving through the center of town, I got pulled over. And I knew immediately what it was. It was because the tags on our car were not updated. I had registered the car, but I hadn't updated the stickers on the car yet, right? It was the first of the month. And so when the cop came over, he was very friendly, came over to the window, and I was explaining to him, yeah, I've got the stickers, and actually they're right here, and I can put them on. He's like, oh, sure, no problem. He's super friendly. And he just went back to his car. And then he was there a really long time. And I was like, what is going on back there, you know? And then finally he came back and his whole demeanor had changed. And he was super serious. And, and he, I was, you know, I was taken aback. And he said, Mrs. Bean, I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the vehicle, come around to the back with me. I was like, okay, all right. So I go around to the back and here I am, you know, everybody I know is driving by. <laughs> And so I'm at the back of this giant homeschooler's van with kids and dog inside, right? And we're at the back, and he's like, I, I called in your license, and your license is suspended, and I'm going to have to arrest you for operating after suspension. It's like, what? And my mind is just spinning. I'm like, what are you, this, you know, and I'm like trying to explain to him. I'm like, there must be some mistake. I don't understand. And like, maybe we can call the DMV. And I'm talking a mile a minute. And as I'm doing this, all of a sudden I realize, you know, my husband used to enjoy watching a show called Cops, which is like a reality TV show. Anybody familiar with it? Yeah, I don't even know if it's on anymore, but I remember he used to like watching that. And as I was kind of watching, you know, a bystander as he's watching these shows, I remember being astonished at the fact like, that these people, as they're getting arrested and they've, you know, they've been caught doing something wrong, how all of them are talking a mile a minute, right? And what do we always know when we're watching these stories? They're all lying, right? And so I was like, as I'm like talking a mile a minute, trying to explain myself to this police officer, I was like, I, he thinks I'm lying, so I need to just keep quiet and we'll figure this out. 
And so I asked him, I was like, what am I going to do with my kids? And like, what are, I, don't, I don't know how to handle this. And he, he allowed me to call my husband, who was just a few minutes away. And my husband, Dan, comes screeching in, right? And he comes over and he tells the cop, well, you know, I don't understand what's going on. Fine, you need to like arrest her, but you're not going to put handcuffs on her. And the cop's like, I have to put handcuffs on her. I was like, okay. And, you know, my, my husband, some of you will get a chance to meet him. He's a real guy's guy. And uh, he was not taking this very well. And he starts interacting with the cop. And I start thinking, oh, my gosh, we're both going to get arrested. <laughs> so I was like, Dan, please take the car. Take the kids. I'll see you downtown, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, so I did. I, got, I had handcuffs. And the, and the cop was super nice. He put them on in the front instead of the back. Special privileges for homeschooling mothers of eight children. And then I, I was in the back of this cop car, right? In the back of this cruiser. And I, I don't know about you, but I've never been in the back of a cruiser before. It's not really nice back there, and it doesn't smell very good. And we go down to the police station, and I got fingerprinted. And then I'm standing there, and I'm, the whole time I'm thinking, what on earth is going on? Like, where am I? Like, what planet is this? And as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, like, you know, I, I don't understand, like, how this connects with, with my life, right? This was not a blessed and beautiful moment because, you know, he, when he goes and, and he takes the photo, right? I've got this photo. I don't know if it's out there. Don't Google. Don't, I don't know. And I've got like mascara streaming down my face because of course I'm crying, right? I don't understand. But let me tell you, if that photo is out there anywhere, it definitely doesn't have the tagline blessed and beautiful underneath it. It was not a blessed and beautiful moment. It didn't make any sense at all, right? And we all find ourselves, whether you're getting arrested or not, we all find ourselves in moments like that in life. It's just messy. It doesn't make sense. It's not blessed and beautiful. So long story short, anyway, it was a DMV mistake where I had gotten a speeding ticket like a year prior to this, and I had paid it, but the payment had arrived a few days late, and they, ass they assigned a late fee that you know, why would the DMV tell me about that, right? And so the late fee was never paid. So my, my license actually was automatically suspended, and I didn't know this. Anyway, and, and my poor husband, he goes and he, he drained our bank account. <laughs> and he comes running with this cash because he has to bail out his jailbird wife, right? And in the end, it only cost $40 for me to go home. <laughs> How embarrassing. I thought I was a threat to society. <laughs> Anyway, it all ended up being resolved, but you know, we have messy moments like that that make zero sense. And despite our best efforts, things fall apart. And we find ourselves in places sometimes where we never expected to be. And you know, that's really where we can feel disillusioned if we allow ourselves to. We can begin to think, this is the mess, the mess is real. Those beautiful things that I felt like were true, they must not be true because we're finding ourselves in these messy situations. And sometimes our lives are ridiculous. Now, I love that word ridiculous, you know? There was years ago, I, I used to, um, I've, I've done all kinds of crazy things and I'm sure you have too. In your, in your home, in your work, in your family life, we women do so many things for so many people and thanks be to God that we do, because people count on us to do these things. And it's important that we do these things. And yet sometimes it feels ridiculous just how much people will ask for from us. I, I, I know, I remember I had a boss once who said, you know, I'm going to ask you to do this because I know that the best person to ask to do something is a busy mom. Because she's going to figure out a way to get it done and get it done efficiently, Right. And, and so many times that's how we feel in life, that people are continually asking us for things. And if we pause and if we assess it, it can feel ridiculous. You know, but I love Mother Angelica, and she talked about ridiculous once. And she said, unless you are willing to do the ridiculous, God will not do the miraculous. When you have God, you don't need to know everything about it. You just do it. And this is where we are, sometimes called to do what feels ridiculous but God doesn't call us once he's already given us all the graces to do the things that he's calling us to do. He calls us and then he gives us the grace in the moment. Sometimes it feels like it takes an awfully long time for those graces to come through, but he is faithful. What Caitlin said this morning about God is a God of abundance is so true. And sometimes we have a scarcity complex and we begin to think, I only have so much time. I only have so much energy. I only have so much strength. Yep. That's all correct, but God is limitless in what he can accomplish through you if you will open yourself up to the ways that he's calling you, the unique mission that he has for you in your life. 
in your work, in your family, in your community, in your relationships. So I'm going to talk about a few different principles. And you know what? I'm an infinitely practical person. I love practical help because, you know, sometimes you'll listen to a talk like, oh, blessed and beautiful. That's lovely, you know, and you'll feel all encouraged and inspired. But when the rubber meets the road, that's sometimes where it all falls apart. And so sometimes we really need to get a little bit practical about these things. How do I live this out? How do I do this? And so I'm going to talk about some different practical principles, practical principles that can help you as you're working toward whatever it is that God is calling you to, that can help you to be equipped for the things that God is calling you to. So these things that I'm going to talk about here today are first, admit that it's hard. Second, do what you're doing. Third, focus on the big picture. And then fourth, rest in God, which is a different approach to prayer. Okay, so first of all, we have to talk about admit that it's hard. So important. And that's part of what I was referencing this morning. I was saying it's good that we come together because it's important to admit that it's hard sometimes. The Christian life is uniquely joyful, but it is also uniquely challenging. The things we are doing in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces, in our marriages are hard. It is hard to live out a faithful life. It is hard to get up day after day and do the thing again. It takes courage to do that. And God is calling us to it anyway, and he's giving us the grace we need to do it. But still, sometimes we feel discouraged. And that's because we're trying to put a happy face on it all the time. You know, I mentioned we have eight children, and they're all very closely spaced. So there was one point in our lives where they were all under the age of 12. And it was, you know, the, the time, this time in our life, we couldn't, like, I, that magical time hadn't yet come where you could leave some kids with other kids and not have to pack up the whole gang every time you left the house. You know, some of you aren't there yet, and I'm here to tell you that time is coming, and it is every bit as magical as you were imagining it being. <laughs> It is a good thing when you can get that respite. But I wasn't there yet when this happened. And there was one morning my husband was leaving for work, and he just happened to say to me at the last minute, oh, I almost forgot. Um, yeah, the dog has an appointment at the vet, and it's in 20 minutes. Okay, as he's leaving for work. And so I was going to have to pack up everybody plus the dog, which is 100% his dog, right, to go to the vet. And so doing this... You know, I found myself in a difficult situation. We need to leave in 20 minutes. And, you know, I was like, okay. So I started doing what any woman does, any valiant woman of faith does when she finds herself in a challenging circumstance. I started yelling. <laughs> so I start yelling at the kids, right? Comb your hair, put on shoes, stop eating popsicles, find the baby. Like, these are the important things you got to do as you're getting out the door. And, you know, I don't know if you have a larger than average size family, or maybe you were raised in a larger than average size family, or maybe because of your Christian values in any way, shape, or form, you stand out in society. It's an uncomfortable thing, isn't it? I definitely experienced that as a child growing up, one of nine, and then raising eight of my own. But that aren't, those aren't the only ways, but it's just an obvious way that you can stand out as living your life a little bit differently from everybody else. And I was always uncomfortable with the attention that I would garner, you know, as we, we were like a traveling circus sideshow all the time. All these kids, right? All these kids in the van. And, you know, any time as they're piling out, it looks like a clown car. You know, I remember people would like count the kids as they're coming out of the van. Like, oh my gosh, right? Wow. Um, so anyway, that's what I was doing. It's like buckle all the kids in, get the dog in, get everybody in. And, you know, I wasn't yet fully embracing this idea of admitting that it's hard. And sometimes we're stuck there. Like we're trying to put a happy face on it. Sometimes because we feel like we stand out, we feel like we need to be kind of spokespersons for happy Christian living. And that puts a lot of pressure on us to make it all look happy and perfect on the outside. And that is for sure where I was as I was going into this veterinarian's office and trying to keep the kids contained. And can I just tell you about the scene in this vet's office? Like there we were with a squawking ferret and a growling German shepherd and then my kids all in a row. And I was just trying to keep it together, right? And, you know, smiling on the outside but sweating on the inside. And I remember that the receptionist like looked at all of us and then she said... Um, excuse me, ma'am, are, are you some kind of a daycare? <laughs> and I was like, um, no. And I was just happy to leave it at that. Like I said, I didn't love the attention, right? So I was just going to leave it at that. But she wasn't satisfied to leave it at that. And she's like, well, then I don't understand. 
what are you doing here with all these children? She said, they aren't, they can't know. They can't possibly be, she said, as she's coming to the impossible realization of what is actually true. They can't all be yours, can they? And there was like dead silence in that vet's office. All eyes were turned on me, and I was like, yes, they are. I think even the ferrets gasped. <laughs> like, nobody could believe this, right? You know, all the air is taken out of the room. Are you kidding me, right? And I remember, like, we went from this circus sideshow to now it was like a rapid-fire talk show, and I was the unwilling guest. Everybody had questions, right? Like, how do you do this? Why would you do this? How many rolls of toilet paper do you go through in a week? What kind of car do you drive? What does your husband do for a living? Do you own a television set? All the things. And so I went through it all, went through it all, and then, you know, I went through the appointment and, you know, trying to smile through it all. And as I was leaving, I remember that same receptionist stopped me and she's like, you know what? I didn't understand you when you first came in here. I didn't understand, like, why you ha would have all these kids, but I've been watching you and now I get it. You're a natural. I mean, sweet and yet hilarious. <laughs> I am a lot of things when it comes to motherhood, but a natural has never been one of them. And I didn't expect her to understand that. I don't even remember what I said to her, but I could have just told her about the shouting that it took to get out the door that morning. Or I could have told her about my introduction to motherhood when I very first ever took a positive pregnancy test. And I sat down on the floor and I cried because it wasn't my plan. How's that for a natural at motherhood? And yet it's been my experience that even when we're not a natural, and let's admit it, it's hard and none of us is, that God is still calling us. It doesn't change the mission. It feels impossible. But it doesn't change what we're called to. None of us is a natural. None of us feels like we have it all together. And sometimes, you know, those voices we talked about in your head, that's sometimes what's really holding us back and hurting us is the fact that we think everybody else has it all figured out. Everybody else has it all together. I'm the only one who's struggling in this way. And it's not true. It's hard for every one of us. And, you know, we talked this morning about that, that idea of sin and how it warps our vision of ourselves and it warps how we approach our calling and it warps our view of God. And it can sometimes lead us to wanting to put on that happy outside just to cover up what's really going on inside. And, you know, I want to be honest, and it's important that we're honest, but with people that we're safe with, right? You don't want to go to, you know, somebody who's not supportive of you in faithful Christian living and tell them how hard it is. But here, you've got a group of supportive women. Here, it's important to let our guard down. Because sometimes the most powerful things we ever do is opening up our hearts and sharing what's hard. And then the other person says, me too. Maybe not exactly the same circumstances or details, but me too. I struggle too. It's hard. There's so much power in making that authentic connection. And yet we get so caught up in outside appearances. We want to make it all look like it's easy. And our pride gets involved too. I think I shared this story back when I, I talked with you all virtually, but I, I got to share it again because it was just so telling, you know, for me, kind of an, an awakening for me was um, years ago, we were, um, we were preparing for guests to come over our house. And this was a new young family we had invited over. And I don't know about you guys, but when you're preparing for guests, like we kind of freak out a little bit, don't we? Yeah. I was doing the thing where I'm yelling at everybody, getting the house in shape, getting clean clothes on the kids and, you know, just everything shined and polished and like getting it together, you know, because of that pressure. And it's not wrong to clean your house before guests come over, but that pressure to make it all look like we've got it all together, just focused on the exterior. And I remember uh, that day that my daughter, Gabby, who was about four at the time, as the young family arrived and they're coming up the walkway, she was so excited to greet our guests. She went and she like flung open the front door and she said, welcome, our house never looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, that is so important because it was true, first of all, but it's also something I've tried to remember through the years. Our house never looks like this. Why am I trying to pretend? Right? And in whatever way you're putting on a show, you know, we talk about like having people over, we talk about entertaining sometimes. That's an interesting word, isn't it? 
entertaining? Are you putting on a show? Whether it's when you're inviting people to your home or when you're having a conversation with a friend, are you putting on a show? Because authentic connection is where we find meaning and purpose in our lives, and putting on a show gets in the way of that. We need to be connecting with each other in our vulnerability. That's an uncomfortable word, but that's where real connection happens. That's where authentic connection happens. In admitting that it's hard, admitting our weaknesses and our flaws, and not that you have to hang your dirty laundry out for everybody, but don't fall prey to the temptation to pretend that you've got it all together all the time. Nobody does. And don't fall prey to the temptation of thinking everybody else has it all together all the time. Nobody does. Their house never looks like that. Remember that. So important. And and to remember that we're all weak. We're all flawed. None of us can do anything at all without God. And in those times in our life where we know that can feel so discouraging. But it's no less true during those times in our life when we feel like we have it all together. Things are going pretty well. We've got it figured out. Got my life together. Still true that you can do nothing without God. Last winter, it was about this time, I was on crutches because I had gone skiing with my husband, taken a hard fall, tore my ACL, was on crutches for over two months, and then had surgery, and then we were recovering from surgery. And you know what? I remember at the time, as frustrating as that was, because, you know, imagine all of a sudden in your life, you're a busy woman, you're doing many things, all of a sudden you can do none of the things, right? really hard. And maybe you've had times in your life where something disrupts you, whether it's the loss of a loved one or illness or job loss or struggling in your marriage or with your children, where it feels like I can't do anything. I'm helpless. And during that time of recovery from surgery, I remember feeling so vulnerable and so weak and kind of frustrated a little bit with my circumstances, you know, where I was entirely dependent on my husband and my teenage boys to be caring for me in some of the most basic ways. Depended on other people to help with cooking and cleaning and different things around the house. And people go through such harder things than that. But I remember at the time, as frustrated as I was, being aware also, what a gift to know just how weak we are. What a gift to know how vulnerable we are, how helpless we truly are. And even if things are going very well in your life right now, we all know in an instant It can change. That's an illusion when you feel like you're in control of things. What a gift to have to face the stark reality that you're not in control of anything, that you need God. What a gift to count on others. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, St. Paul writes, three times I begged the Lord about this. This is his feeling of weakness, right? A flaw. We're not sure what it was. That it might leave me But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Think about that. Where do you feel weak? Can you see that as a strength in Christ? Can you see that as an opportunity to know who you really are and what you can really do, which is nothing? We don't like to think about that. And yet it's true. So it's important to admit that it's hard, that we all struggle, make authentic connections based on that reality, that it's hard. Okay, the second thing I want to encourage you to think about is do what you are doing, which sounds very simple and very basic, right? Aren't we all doing what we are doing? This is a phrase that I learned from Father Benedict Grishel years ago. Um, He's since died. He was the founder of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Are people familiar with Father Grishel? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Look him up if you're not familiar. I think the next generation maybe doesn't know him as well. Um, But he talked about this idea of doing what you are doing. And it really was kind of counter to our cultural idea which kind of makes an idol of busyness, doesn't it? Like, do you ever pay attention? If you start listening, you'll start hearing it because everybody's so busy. Don't you hear this a lot? Right, you'll run into a friend at the store and you'll be like, oh, how are you? Oh, busy, right? Oh, how are you? I'm busy too. We're all so busy. And we wear it like it's a badge, like it's a virtue to be busy. Busy and distracted. 
So Father Grishel had this idea of do what you were doing, which means allow yourself to do just one thing at a time and be fully present in your life. Be fully present to the work that is before you. Be fully present, even more importantly, to the people that are present in front of you. And so he wrote about this, part of temperance is taking care of ourselves. Obsessive compulsive workaholism is obviously not a sign of temperance. Even if we enjoy our work, we need to practice temperance and get adequate rest. Enjoy what's going on while it's going on. Do you let yourself do this? How many times are you doing something but thinking about 700 other things you need to be doing? You're not present in that moment. He says, if you go to the supermarket, enjoy it. Don't make it drudgery. Talk to the cashier. Speak to the people at the fruit counter. Chat with the neighbor. Try to get to know them and talk with them. And it makes your passage through life as pleasant as possible. He says, many people are intemperate because they are miserable and suffering. Their life is a big, long misery, and so they decide to brighten it up with mountains of potato chips. They're addicted to things. But look at your own in temperateness and see if unhappiness is causing it. I think that's an important call there to look at what we're tempted to distract ourselves with. What are you busy with? What are we doing? What are our goals for ourselves, for our marriages, for our work, for our kids? You need to allow yourself to do one thing at a time because it's enough. Another cute story from my daughter Gabby. She's been teaching me life lessons her whole young life. Um, was years ago, I remember her interrupting me while I was kind of scrolling through my phone, and we can all relate to that, right? And I remember telling her, I'm not even looking away from my phone, and just saying, go ahead, tell mama what you want to say, I'm listening. And she said, no, I want you to listen with your eyes. That has stayed with me too, because our house never looks like this. But also, the only thing people in your life want from you is for you to listen with your eyes. What are we not listening to? Where in life is God calling you to focus? Because ultimately, ironically, when we're so busy doing all of these important things for our work, for our families, it's our work and it's our families who suffer because we're so busy and distracted. You know, I have a friend who once said to me, what busy stands for, B-U-S-Y, is being under Satan's yoke. Yeah, that one also has stayed with me. A little bit convicting. Because we can begin to think that it's a virtue to be busy, but it's not at all. He will distract us. He will pull us away from the truly important things that God wants to be working through us in our lives. What God is calling us to do. Being under Satan's yoke. Maybe we're not going to be so busy with that. So ask yourself. Like It's so important, first of all, you know, to, to look at our lives in practical ways, to look at your calendar. What are you doing? Where are you spending your time? Is it a good use of your time? Ask yourself these basic questions, because I think sometimes life gets so busy, we get caught up in it. And maybe we never pause to say, is this thing that I'm committed to doing serving me anymore? Is this thing pulling me away, maybe, from God's plan for my life? Look at your calendar and look at your bank statement because those things will tell you what you really value in life. Where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? That's what you value, regardless of what you say your priorities are. Be present to whatever it is that's in front of you. And we all know, right, thanks be to God for the women that do work in our lives and for the good work that each of you I know is doing in your workplaces, in your schools, in your communities, your churches, your homes, your families, your marriages, so many things we're doing. You know, I had a good friend once who told me around Christmas time, she said, you know what, I was complaining to my husband about all the things that I've got to do, and that's such a busy time of year, right? We know. And she said, he turned to me and he said, don't worry, it all always gets done. <laughs> my friend said, yeah. That's because I do it, right? And our families need us to be doing these things, but sometimes we feel overwhelmed by it all. Be honest about what things are costing you. Learn the fine art of saying no to something 
It's a complete sentence. Because when we say no to something, we're saying yes to something else. When we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else. Because the world will tell you, you can have it all, you can do it all. But the fact is, you can't have it all and do it all at once. We do need to prioritize. We do need to consider ways that we're busy that are pulling us away from what God wants us to truly be focusing on. And if nothing else, begin by keeping holy the Sabbath. Is this a practice for you? The day is supposed to be set aside. Sundays are supposed to be different. And yet our culture will pull us into this idea of busyness and productivity to the point where Sunday is just another day to get stuff done, right? And it can be countercultural to push back on this a little bit. Even, you know, things get scheduled on Sundays. I remember years ago, we had a bunch of kids in all different kinds of youth sports. And practices were always scheduled on Sundays, right? It probably happens here, too. And I remember we were frustrated about this, but, you know, we were, we were trying to go along. We wanted to be sure our kids had the opportunity to play these sports. And so we're trying to figure out a way to make it happen. But, you know, we decided we, we, really, we really need to stand up and just not attend sports activities on Sunday and, you know, However that works out, it's, gonna, it's just going to be. We need to respect Sundays as a day of rest. And at one point, I remember I was in a group chat on my phone with you know, a coach and a team for one of our kids. And, and the coach sent out this message to all of the parents in this chat saying, you know, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., we're going to have practice at such and such a field or whatever. And I remember being like, oh, great. Now I'm going to have to be the weirdo. I'm going to have to say we're not going to be there and all of that. And I was like fixing myself, getting ready to reply. And all of a sudden, another reply came in before I had a chance to do that. And it said, you know, coach, you know, thank you, but we can't do Sunday activities. Sundays are for family and for church. And I was like, oh, I'm so gratified. Like, I'm not the only weirdo. I was just so grateful, you know. And, and then I looked a little closer, and it was my husband who had sent that text. <laughs> so... You may be weirdos, but be weirdos together, right? Be bonded in that. You're not alone in it. So keep holy the Sabbath and be stingy with your time. Be stingy with your time so that you can focus it on the people that God has placed in your life for you to love because there's no replacement for that. You know, I shared that we homeschooled our kids and I always called myself a reluctant homeschooler because... It's a lot of work, and it definitely wasn't something I ever felt equipped to do, especially. Didn't feel like I was even very good at it in a lot of ways. But, you know, when I look back on it now, and we're still homeschooling one, we still have one, um, I, you know, I value it not for all the reasons why we went into it in the first place. I value it for the time spent together. There, you can't replace that. And homeschooling is not the only way to do that, right? I just want to encourage you to think about the ways in your life that you can put a greater focus on spending time together. Pope Francis encouraged families to waste time together. I think that's such a beautiful phrase because it really stands out to us because that's a countercultural thing. Like the world will tell you, do not waste time. Make sure every moment is productive. But waste time together. Waste time with the people that God has placed in your life for you to love, for you to look in the eyes and love. All right, the next principle I want to share with you is to focus on the big picture. So when we're talking about the bigger picture, you know, God sees the big picture. We don't see the big picture. We don't know how these things are all working out, but we can work on having that perspective a little bit more and just focusing on some of the basics. You know, I had a friend years ago who used to have a banner in her kitchen, and on it she had painted the letters GTHBYB. And I asked her, what is that? What does that stand for? And she said, get to heaven, bring your brother. <laughs> okay, family motto. I like it. You know what? Because that's all any of us ever needs to be doing. That's the point. Whatever you're doing, get to heaven, bring your brother. What are you doing in your life? Is it getting you closer to heaven? Is it bringing others closer to heaven? What are you doing in your marriage? Is your marriage doing that? Is your family life doing that? Is your schoolwork doing that? Is your home life doing that? In your community, are you doing that? Are you getting to heaven and bringing others with you? Because you know what? In the world, it can be tempting to focus on accomplishments, and the world will tell us, you know, you got to have your checklist. you got to have all the things to show. And yet we talked even a little bit this morning about how sometimes in life are not very conducive to a tangible sense of accomplishment. You can do a lot of good work and have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. 
The world's not going to see it. The world's not going to applaud you for it. You know, if you've ever raised a toddler, just having the house kind of sort of look at the end of the day like it looked at the beginning of the day is a major accomplishment. You know, uh, someone once shared with me the, the comparison of a busy woman who's like, looks all like streamlined on the outside, right, with a, a duck that's swimming. Right? Because if you watch a duck that's swimming on the water, you see they're just gliding along, right? They look so peaceful and serene. But if you look under the water, what is that duck doing? Paddling, paddling, right? Non-stop, exhausting motion. And how many of us are doing that? Where it's not seen, we're working so hard, and there's not a lot to show for it, whether you're caring for small children or aging parents or teaching children in school or even just doing good work connecting and building relationships in your community and your church. It's a lot of little things. It's a lot of work. And there's not a lot to show for it when you're trying to list your accomplishments at the end of the day. But ultimately, when we're looking back over a day, this is how we need to be assessing our days. Not with the list of accomplishments that the world would recognize and applaud. But did you bring yourself and others closer to heaven? If you did that, that's a good day. That's all we need. Get to heaven. Bring your brother. And it can be so tempting sometimes to feel like, because we're busy and because we're capable of doing many things, to feel like we can somehow earn God's love with the good things that we're doing. Like, and maybe sometimes we're tempted, even if we don't express it exactly like this, but if you think about it, maybe this is your approach to God. Like, I'm so busy. I'm doing all of these good things. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, there'll be time for God later when these things are, are done, they're taken care of. But if we look at the story of Mary and Martha, what is Jesus doing? But interrupting Martha, we talked about interruptions this morning. Jesus is interrupting Martha and telling her not to never do those things. Those things are important, but to see it in proper perspective, to know that the more important thing is relationship with the Lord. We need to be rooted in that. He's inviting her, like her sister, to sit at his feet. Think about that posture of sitting at the Lord's feet and looking up at him. It's like a childlike posture. It's trusting in him. It's wanting to learn from him about who, who you are. We need to make time for doing that in our lives. Because God didn't come down, and I want you to think about this, Next week, as we're going through the liturgies of Holy Week, he didn't come to suffer and die for some nameless, faceless throng of humanity in some general sense. It's personal. He came to suffer and die for you because he loves you deeply, intimately, personally. He's not discouraged by your weaknesses and your flaws. He's inviting you, like he invited Martha, to the better part which is relationship with him. He's inviting her to see that. And he has such a beautiful love for each of us personally. And we can forget that because even in our faith lives, we can get busy. We can get distracted. You know, you might be going to church and you'll check off that box. You might say your rosary, check off that box. But he wants something deeper and more personal with you. In Isaiah chapter 49, we read, Can a mother forget her infant? Be without tenderness for the child of her womb. Even if she should forget, I will never forget you. See upon the palms of my hands, I have engraved you. Do we see that? That God isn't far away. He's present. And he loves you so personally, so uniquely. You are engraved on the palms of his hands. He knows you in and out and loves you with a mother's love, with a father's love that's all-encompassing. Even when our human relationships fail us, and they do, still he loves us. Even when we fail ourselves, and we do, still he loves us with that deep, intimate, personal love. You are engraved on the palms of God's hands. He has the hairs on your head counted. If you look at the image of a crucifix, Jesus says he hangs bleeding and dying for you. 
Does that look like a guy who kind of sort of cares? No. He is all in committed to you. And so let's talk about that. What kind of relationship does God want to have with you? Obviously, an intimate, personal, reciprocal one. He's giving you his whole self. So the fourth principle I want to talk about is about how we can rest in God. He says, come to me, you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah. We all want that rest. But what does he mean by that? He will give us rest. And this is important for us to think about because sometimes we can begin to think about our relationship with God as another chore in our lives. Prayer time, it's another to-do. It's another box to check off. And yet what he's inviting us to see is that it's really about relationship. Where like Mary was sitting at his feet, he wants us to be doing the same. And, you know, we for sure, are called to do many and important things in the world. But if we want an authentic relationship with God, then we need to be making time that is set aside for him alone. And I'm not going to tell you how long it needs to be or how often you need to do it. You need to ask yourself that question. You need to ask God that question. Where in your life can you make more time for God? Can you find it? Because, you know, when we're talking about being busy, when we're talking about what your priorities are, Like, God is waiting patiently for a deeper relationship with you. Wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus, he's calling you into a deeper relationship with him, wherever you are. And he's not a pushy jerk, so he's not going to take over. He's not going to shout over Netflix. He's not going to interrupt your scrolling of Instagram. He's going to wait patiently for you to turn to him and see that this is a relationship. Prayer is a relationship that is for you. It's not something you're doing for God. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need that. But we're, we're holding ourselves back. And sometimes we're holding ourselves back because we kind of have like a transactional relationship with God, right? You think like, okay, I've got, I've got my prayer list. I'm going to go. I'm going to pray all the things. And then I'm going to expect something back, right? The things that I prayed for. Some, and it's not bad to pray for specific outcomes. But we need to realize that prayer is really more about going deeper in relationship with God. That's what he wants from you. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I fall prey to this thinking about prayer like I have like this, I call it a gumball machine approach to prayer. Like I'm going to put in my prayer time, right? I'm putting my coin. I'm going to turn the handle and then I'm going to get my prize. It's about getting what you want, transactional. That's not what it's about. And yes, God wants you to go to him with with everything that you want, but he also is calling on you to trust him with everything you want. And sometimes you don't know what you want. You don't know what's good for you. And I want to challenge you to think about what are you trusting in your life instead of God? What are you holding back? What are you worried about losing? Because, you know, what does Jesus want from you? He only wants everything. He wants your whole life. And that's scary. C.S. Lewis has this great quote that I love. He says, we are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are simply wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. And isn't that the truth? We're a little bit worried. I can't trust God because what if he takes that away from me? What in your life are you holding back? It's a scary idea that he wants everything from you. But I like to look at the the story in the Gospels. And we read two different stories of women who anoint Jesus, right, with expensive perfumed oil. And in the first one that we read about, this woman is a great sinner. And she goes to him, and she has, we read, an alabaster jar of ointment that she breaks open with which she anoints the feet of Jesus. And she's crying, washing his feet with her tears. And she's wiping his feet with her hair. And she's kissing his feet. This woman is not holding anything back. And we know that she's a sinner. And she's pouring herself out upon Jesus in this loving way, in this personal way. It's such an intimate story. I encourage you to spend some time just reading that story and reflecting on it, the intimacy of that love and what she's doing. And Jesus tells her her sins are forgiven because she's loved much. And also, it's important to note, and this is, there's significance here, that scripture describes it as an alabaster jar that this ointment is in, this costly, expensive ointment, right? It's perfumed. And 
an alabaster jar wasn't, at the time, the kind of thing where you, you, you have like a screw top on the top and you take a little out and then put the top back on and save the rest for later. If you had something in an alabaster jar, you had to break it open to use it. It was all at once. And so I like to challenge myself, and I want to challenge you to think about what are you afraid of breaking? What are you holding back? What is your alabaster jar that's too precious to trust the Lord with? What are you worried about losing? What are you placing your faith in instead of him? Maybe it's very good things that you have in your life. He, in, he intends for us to have good things in our lives, good human relationships, good work, money and things and children and marriage and friendships, our good health. What are you afraid of losing? What are you holding back? What are you thinking? I can't trust God with this. This is too precious. You know, sometimes it's the scariest thing in the world to pray those words, thy will be done, and actually mean them. If you find yourself struggling to trust in God, join the club. We are all there. This is part of our human experience, right? When we, fig when we finally figure out how to perfectly trust God with our whole lives, we don't need to figure anything else out. We've got it figured out. That's it. That's what he's always calling on us to do to pray those words, thy will be done, and mean them. But if you feel yourself holding back, if you feel afraid, if you feel insecure, bring that to God. Make that your prayer. Say, Lord, I want to trust you. Help me to grow in trust. Help me to know you. Because you know what? You're not going to trust somebody that you never spend any time with, that you don't know. And when we're busy, it can be tempting to say like, and I've heard this and I've said it myself many times, oh, my life is a prayer. It is. It can be good and true that your life is a prayer. But I'm telling you this, it is not a prayer if you never have time that you're actually spending in prayer. It needs to be based on that real relationship with God, which is intimate, which is personal, which is where he's going to give you that rest that you are seeking. He wants us to give him all of ourselves for our own good. He's not out to get us. Sometimes we might have a faulty idea of who God is and think, He's kind of out to get us. I can't trust him with these things because he's going to take them all away. What are you holding back? And sometimes we hold back too because, you know, we think, I can't spend this time in prayer. I can't spend this time because I've got so much work to do, so much important work to do. I don't have time to do it. First of all, I'm going to encourage you to know it doesn't have to be hours every day, but it does need to be every day. St. Faustina, who is, you know, this beautiful little nun that lived in Poland in the first part of the 20th century. And she had these, throughout her lifetime, was blessed to have these visions and these visits with Jesus. And, you know, he was giving her this great work of kind of founding this feast of divine mercy in the church and spreading the word about God's mercy, this devotion to divine mercy with the chaplet, with the feast of divine mercy, which is coming soon, right? The Sunday after Easter. And he was calling on her to do this work. And sometimes she really struggled. You know, if you read her diary, we're, we're blessed to have her diary, which is very personal. Like all of these things that she struggled with. She knew God was calling her to do things. And she was so focused on, I've got to do this great work. And yet she ends up coming to this realization that she needs to trust in Jesus rather than her own work. And I'm going to share with you this passage from her diary, which is just so beautiful. She said, I have come to understand today that even if I did not accomplish any of the things the Lord is demanding of me, I know that I shall be rewarded as if I had fulfilled everything because he sees the intention with which I begin. And even if he called me to himself today, the work would not suffer at all by that because he himself is the Lord of both the work and the worker. My part is to love him to folly. All works are nothing more than a tiny drop before him. It is love that has meaning and power and merit. He has opened up great horizons of my soul. Love compensates for the chasms. That is so powerful. There's a message for each of you there in that. That he sees the intention with which I begin. He sees that. It's not about what you're accomplishing. It's not about what the world might see or even what might feel good for you to check off the boxes. All of what we do is a drop. It's not something we're accomplishing. It's something we're allowing God to accomplish in us. 
and that love compensates for the chasms. I love that phrase. Because we all have those chasms. We know where we're lacking. We know where we're falling short. And it's so tempting to feel frustrated by that. All right, one last gospel passage that I want to share with you as we're kind of rounding up here. Um, First, a reminder of the the four different principles that I've I've shared with you here today. First, admit that it's hard. Do what you're doing. Focus on the big picture and then rest in God through authentic prayer. But, you know, the last gospel story I want to share with you, and when we read the gospels, when we read scripture, we're meant to place ourselves in these stories. This is a beautiful way to pray. You know, sometimes I hear from people and they're like, I don't know how to read my Bible. I don't know how to, I don't even know how to pray. I don't know where to start. This is a beautiful way to pray with scripture is to read a passage of scripture and it can be very short and just place yourself in it. Experience it. Imagine what it would be like in that story. And so this is a story from Mark chapter five with what I call the sleeping girl. So this is the girl that Jesus raised from the dead. It says, while he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, why this commotion? Why the weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were there with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, arise. The girl, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. Talitha kum. Can you place yourself in this gospel story? Can you imagine Jesus waking you like that? Because we are all asleep. Jesus is trying to wake us to deeper relationship with him. Wherever you are in your relationship with God, he wants more. We're asleep to him. Will we wake up and hear him? Can you imagine him saying your name, holding your hand, interrupting the important stuff that you've got going on. And those words, Talitha kum, arise. My daughter, arise. He's speaking to you here today. He's speaking to you every moment of your life. Will you feel him holding your hand? Will you hear his voice? Will you listen? And will you wake up and trust in him? Place all of your trust in him to know that Even if you feel like you're not up to the task, he is. Even if you are discouraged by your circumstances and they don't feel like they're matching up with what you know is good and true about who God called you to be, he is not discouraged. He is calling you anyway. He's waking you up. Will you listen to him? Will you trust in him and receive all that he wants to give you? Thank you.